Hi, this is Dr. A with a clinical chemistry review video on testing for lipids and lipoproteins. All right, let's start with total cholesterol. So it can be performed as a single test during cholesterol screening, screenings like for health fairs. And again, it has a, there's a finger stick uh, that you can do and it just checks for cholesterol. And the cool thing there is that you know, for total cholesterol, you don't have to be fasting, so you can just do it any time of the day. It is normally, though, ran as part of the lipid panel, and the lipid panel will include total cholesterol, triglyceride, and HDL, and then the LDL and DLDL are calculated using the Friedel-Wald equation uh, based on the measurements of cholesterol, triglycerides, and HDL. The reference method for total cholesterol is isotope dilution mass spectrometry, but the enzymatic method is what is used by uh, most clinical chemistry lab. In this enzymatic method, you have cholesterol ester hydrolase cleaves the fatty acid residue from cholesterol ester, and that converts it to free cholesterol, which is unesterified. That free cholesterol then can react with cholesterol oxidase. It produces hydrogen peroxide, which is then used as a substrate for an enzymatic color reaction, which is then proportional to the amount of cholesterol and can be measured uh, spectrophotometrically at about 500 nanometers. So the specimen for total cholesterol can be refrigerated at 4 degrees Celsius for several days uh, if uh, testing is to be delayed. Um, generally, it uses heparinized plasma or serum. Uh, cholesterol testing alone does not require a fasting specimen, but because it is often ordered as part of a lipid panel, uh, then you would need a 12-hour fast, and that's because of triglycerides. So if they order a lipid panel, a fast is required, ideally anyway. The reference range for adults on total cholesterol, uh, desirable is you want a cholesterol less than 200 milligrams per DL or 5.18 millimoles per liter. Borderline high to moderate risk for cardiovascular disease is going to be 200 to 239 milligrams per DL. And high risk is going to be greater than or equal to 240 milligrams per DL. That would be high risk for cardiovascular disease. So triglycerides. Uh, it does require a 12-hour fast. The reference method is a GCMS method that involves the hydrolysis of fatty acids on triglycerides, of triglycerides, from triglycerides, and the measurement of glycerol. The clinical labs use an enzymatic reaction. Uh, there are several variations to it. All variations will use enzymes to separate the triglycerides into glycerol and fatty acids, but then it will do coupled enzymatic reactions to measure the production of glycerol, usually using the hydrogen, an enzyme that produces hydrogen peroxide, and then using that with peroxidase for color change, and then that color change is going to be proportional to the glycerol, which then is supposed to be proportional to the triglycerides. Your reference range for adults. Uh, desirable uh, triglycerides can be anything less than 150 milligrams per DL, and that is, remember, fasting. Borderline high is 150 to 199 milligrams per DL. High risk for cardiovascular disease is 200 to 499 milligrams per DL. And very high risk is anything greater than 500 milligrams per DL. Um, this is what uh, high triglycerides will look like. Again, it's because of the high amount of calomicrons. Uh, high triglycerides will make the plasma very, very cloudy, or to the point sometimes of looking like milk if it's really, really high. Specimens of choice are usually heparinized plasma and or serum. So your high-density lipoprotein, the accepted reference method for HDL is a three-step procedure that includes the ultrasimplification to remove the VLDL, the uh, treatment with heparin manganese to remove the LDL, then the, what's left, the supernatin, is assayed using an Abel Levy Brody Kendall uh, cholesterol analysis method. There is a cheaper and quicker reference method that can be used now. It uses dex direct dextran sulfate to precipitate uh, the other, the non HDL cholesterols, and it is followed by an Abel Kendall uh, cholesterol analysis method. There are also uh, homogeneous assays that are more commonly used in a clinical lab, and a first reagent is used to block all the non HDL cholesterol, followed by a second reagent to quantify the HDL cholesterol. Samples again are same as the others, uh, heparinized plasma or serum. The reference range for adult women, uh, which is different for men. So uh, 
if you're at less than average risk if you are uh, have your HDL of 60 milligrams per DL or higher you're at average risk at 50 to 59 milligrams per DL and increased risk if it's less than 50. For men you're less than average if you're higher than 60 or 60 or higher. Your average risk at between 40 and 50 uh, milligrams uh, it should actually be 40 to 59. Sorry about that. And an increased risk uh, less than 40 milligrams per DL. So uh, really the biggest difference is, is here this, this increased cutoff women we need to be less than 50 uh, I'm sorry women are at high risk if they're less than 50 men are at high risk if they're less than 40 everybody really should be above 60 so that's uh, HDL so LDL is usually calculated so it's usually calculated using the Friedel-Wald equation which says that LDL is equal to the total cholesterol minus uh, the HDL added to the triglycerides divided by 5 or you could say total cholesterol minus the HDL minus the triglycerides divided by 5. Uh, the triglycerides divided by 5 by itself is the VLDL but this equation is valid only for patients with a triglyceride level that is less than 400. So if the triglyceride level is really, really high, there this uh, LDL will not be calculated. And uh, if you run a lipid panel, your result on the LDL will say not calculated. So what happens then uh, if the physician still wants to get uh, uh, an LDL then you have to do some kind of direct method so beta quantification is the most common direct LDL reference method and it combines ultracentrifugation and chemical precipitation there are some automated methods that are similar to the direct HDL methods where the LDL is separated from the other lipid fractions and it quantified the ranges for adults for LDL so optimal you want less you want less than 100 milligrams per DL uh, and if you have coronary vascular disease or diabetes, you want to be at less than 70. So it's really low. Above up, optimal is 100 to 129, which means they don't really worry about it too much unless you have other risk factors. Borderline high is 130 to 159 milligrams per DL. High is 160 to 189 milligrams per DL. And very high is greater than 190 milligrams per DL. And then a little bit on apolipoprotein testing. So ApoB can be measured directly in serum by immunoassay, and it's the main LDL and VLDL protein. So that elevations could be due to a high fat di diet and or decreased clearing of the LDL from the blood, or it can be genetic. Uh, so ApoB would be almost kind of like a sub marker for LDL, if you will. So LDL and VLDL. So ApoE, uh, I'm sorry, ApoA1 is measured by separation and analysis of HDL cholesterol. ApoA1 is the main HDL protein. Low levels are correlated with uh, CHD risk. Again, so you can almost sub ApoA1 for HDL. So the low is not good, high is good. Lipoprotein A uh, is commonly measured by various immunoassays. Again, it's a variant of LDL with a different protein, uh, apolipoprotein A pro, uh, protein stuck to it. And it's an independent indicator of coronary heart disease risk. And it is genetic, it can be genetically determined and not influenced by diet and lifestyle, but it does vary between people. Uh, it just within the person itself it's usually pretty steady. Conditions that can increase it though are low estrogen levels, severe underactive thyroid, uncontrolled diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and nephrotic syndrome can uh, call incre all increase lipoprotein A levels. And then lastly we're going to talk a little bit about LDL particles. So that's a newer testing uh, that's out there and uh, Part of it, what it does is instead of looking at the total LDL cholesterol level, it looks at the particles, the number of particles and their size. And so um, the low density lipoprotein particles are byproducts of fat transport uh, that then remain in circulation for an extended amount of time. Uh, LDL particles can penetrate the artery wall and get stuck and they contribute to forming the fatty plaque that uh, then leads to blockage of arteries. The tests can measure the number of particles uh, it, but 
but not it was not well you you can measure the total uh, LDL concentration but here what uh, the total concentration doesn't tell you what the makeup of of it is whereas LDL particle does so one we look at the number of particles and we also look at the particle sizes too and so uh, it is a more accurate assessment of risk than the total LDL cholesterol and an increased LDL particle uh, increased number of LDL particles does add to the risk of developing cardiovascular disease above and beyond the risk associated with the LDL cholesterol. The lowdown on the LDL particles is what you don't want is a whole lot of small, really dense LDL particles that are bouncing around your arteries like little BB guns and causing damage. What you do want are a, a lesser amount of LDL particles, but they're being bigger and fluffier and bouncing around like beach balls basically if you think about it so um, and so beyond just the total LDL cholesterol this actually gives a more accurate uh, predictor of risk for cardiovascular events and this is your last slide thank you so much for your attention